Hello and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Pastor Jacob Swenson, and I am your guide as we are working our way through the Book of Concord in preparation for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It is especially good to be with you today because, well, I'm recording this on Reformation Day. You you won't hear this till after that, but I'm recording this on Reformation Day, and so I, I wish a continued and blessed Reformation Day to you all. Today we pick up in paragraph 15 of Article 2 in the Apology, and we've been talking about original sin and how the adversaries, the Roman Catholics, they uh, they accept Article 2 of the Augsburg Confession as long as we understand original sin in a different way. And so this is where Melanchthon is coming at. He's like, well, they accept our Article 2, but in accepting it, they actually change the definition of original sin. So Melanchthon has been laying out what do we mean by original sin. And we left off in paragraph 14 where, well, we mean that original sin includes ignorance of God, contempt for God, not having fear and trust in God, the inability to love God. Now, I pick up today in paragraph 15, and we're going to do paragraphs 15 through 41 today, and then I think we'll finish, if I look ahead a second, I think we will finish Article 2 tomorrow, but today we're going to get kind of the middle section of it. So we begin in paragraph 15. I'm reading from Concordia of the Lutheran Confessions, and I invite you to follow along at bookofconcord.org. Paragraph 15, Melanchthon writes, We have not said anything new. The ancient definition of original sin understood correctly says precisely the same thing. Original sin is the absence of original righteousness. But what is righteousness? Here the scholastics wrangle over philosophical questions. They do not explain what original righteousness is. In the scriptures... Righteousness consists not only in obeying the second table of the Ten Commandments, which are about good works in serving our fellow man, but also the first table, which teaches about fearing God, faith, and loving God. Therefore, original righteousness includes not only physical health in all ways, as they contend, but also these gifts, a sure and certain knowledge of God, fear of God, confidence in God, and the desire and ability to give God these things. Scripture testifies to this when it says in Genesis 1 verse 27 that man was made in the image and likeness of God. What else was this image and likeness other than that man was created with wisdom and righteousness so that he could apprehend God and reflect God? Mankind was given the gift of knowing God, fearing God, and being confident in God. This is how Irenaeus and Ambrose interpret the likeness to God. Ambrose not only says many things to this effect, but especially declares, That soul is not, therefore, in the image of God, in which God is not dwelling at all times. Paul shows in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 that the image of God is the knowledge of God, righteousness, and truth. Lombard is not afraid to say that original righteousness is the very likeness to God which God implanted in man. We recount the opinions of the ancients, which in no way interfere with Augustine's interpretation of the image. So the Melanchthon is pointing out that, well, the Roman Catholics, what do they mean by original righteousness? Is that, well, man had perfect health and wouldn't die. And Melanchthon is saying, well... Original righteousness really means to be created in the image of God, to be in the image of God. And when we look at the scriptures and the church fathers, they define original righteousness as that man was created to know and love God, to be in communion with him. And the fathers, Ambrose and Irenaeus, for example, say that This is what original righteousness is, is to fear and love and trust in God. So Melanchthon is pointing out that that the Lutherans are not departing, A, from Scripture, or B, 
from the fathers of the church. Paragraph 23. The ancient definition of original sin is that it is a lack of righteousness. This definition not only denies that mankind is capable of obedience in his body, but also denies that mankind is capable of knowing God, placing confidence in God, fearing and loving God, and certainly also the ability to produce such things. For even the theologians themselves teach in their schools that these are not produced without certain gifts and the aid of grace. In order that the matter may be understood, we say that these gifts are precisely the knowledge of God and fear and confidence in God. From these facts, it appears that the ancient definition says precisely the same thing that we say, denying fear and confidence toward God. It denies not only the actions, but also the gifts and ability to produce these acts. So the ancient definition of original sin, which the Lutherans hold, is that mankind, by nature, apart from God's grace, is not able to love, trust, and serve God. Mankind is incapable of these things without the intervention of the Holy Spirit. Paragraph 24. Of equal importance is the definition of original sin found in the writings of Augustine. He is used to defining original sin as concupiscence or wicked desire. He means that when righteousness had been lost, concupiscence came in its place. Since diseased nature cannot fear and love God and believe God, it seeks and loves carnal things. By nature, when we are secure, we hold God's judgment in contempt. When we are terrified, we hate God's judgment. This is why Augustine includes both the defect and the vicious habit that has come in, in its place in his definition of original sin. Concupiscence is not only a corruption of physical qualities, but also, in the higher powers, a vicious turning to fleshly things. So, concupiscence and original sin means not only that we're going to die, but it also includes an inclination to do the things that God doesn't want us to do. These people do not realize the contradiction in what they say. At the same time, they attribute to mankind a concupiscence that is not entirely destroyed by the Holy Spirit, and also the ability to love God above all things. So Melanchthon says the Roman Catholic opponents, they contradict themselves because they say, on the one hand, man has original sin and he's going to die. On the other hand, at the same time, he is also by nature able to love and serve God. And Lutherans say, these things go together. The fact that we're going to die and the fact that by nature we can't fear and love and trust in God. Paragraph 26. We are right in our description of original sin when we say that it is not being able to believe God and not being able to fear and love God. We are right when we say that it includes concupiscence, which seeks fleshly things contrary to God's word. This means when it seeks not only the pleasure of the body, but also fleshly wisdom and righteousness. Therefore it holds God in contempt when it trusts in these as good things. It is not only the ancient teachers, but even the more recent teachers, at least the wiser ones among them, who teach that original sin is both the defects I have mentioned and concupiscence. Thomas Aquinas says, Original sin includes the loss of original righteousness, and with this a disorderly arrangement of the parts of the soul. Therefore, it is not pure loss, but a corru corrupt habit. Bonaventure says, When the question is asked, What is original sin? The correct answer is that it is immoderate concu concupiscence. The correct answer is also that it is a lack of the righteousness that is due. And in one of these replies, the other is included. This is also Hugo's opinion when he says that Original sin is ignorance in the mind and concupiscence in the flesh. He is saying that when we are born, we bring with us ignorance of God, unbelief, distrust, contempt, and hatred of God. When he mentions ignorance, he includes these other things. These opinions also agree with Scripture. 
Paul sometimes clearly calls it a defect, as in 1 Corinthians 2, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. In another place, he calls it concupiscence, at work in our members to bear fruit for death. That's Romans 7. We could cite more passages relating to both parts, but when a fact is so clear that there is no need of further testimonies, the intelligent reader realizes easily that to be without the fear of God and without faith are more than actual guilt. They are abiding defects in our unregenerate nature. Right? So, I love what Melanchthon does here. And we're going to get this throughout the Apology. Melanchthon was very sharp on the church fathers. And repeatedly throughout the Apology, he's going to use the church fathers against the Roman Catholics. And and there's going to be a couple points where he's going to call out uh, you, well, you tried to cite the church fathers, but you translated them incorrectly, or you only took them out of context. So there's going to be some spots where he's like, well, you quoted this guy here, but if you read a paragraph later, he actually sides with us. Um, so that's really fun. So here he's quoting all these church fathers, Aquinas, Bonaventure, uh, Victor Hugo, Augustine, Ambrose, Irenaeus. Uh, Melanchthon is a classicist, and so he's he's showing that the Lutherans do not depart from what the church has always taught. And that continues today. We we don't. Now, I mean confessional Lutheranism, not the Lutheranism that really ex- that is seeking to join fellowship with Rome, you know, really actively right now, uh, the Lutheran World Federation. The Missouri Synod is not part of that. Um, so when I mean confessional Lutheranism, we do not depart from what has always been taught. Anyway, paragraph 32. When it comes to original sin, we hold nothing different from either Scripture or the Church Catholic. Rather, we cleanse from corruptions and restore to light the most important declarations of Scripture and the Fathers, which have been covered over by the sophistry and controversies of the theologians of our day. It is more than clear that modern theologians do not notice what the Fathers mean when they speak about a defect. The knowledge of original sin is absolutely necessary. The magnitude of Christ's grace cannot be understood unless our diseases are recognized. Christ says in Matthew 9 and Mark 2, Those who are well have no need of a physician. The entire notion that a person is righteous is mere hypocrisy before God. We must acknowledge that our heart is, by nature, destitute of fear, love, and confidence in God. For this reason, the prophet Jeremiah says, After I was instructed, I slapped my thigh. I was ashamed, and I was confounded. Jeremiah 31. Likewise, I said in my alarm, All mankind are liars. That is, they do not think correctly about God. Here our adversaries attack Martin Luther because he wrote that Original sin remains after baptism. They add that this point was justly condemned by Leo X. But his imperial majesty will discover a clear slander on this point. Our adversaries know in what sense Luther intended this remark, that original sin remains after baptism. Luther always writes that baptism removes the guilt of original sin. However, the material, as they call it, of the sin concupiscence remains. So what Luther means is that the guilt of original sin, the guiltiness that we have before God for original sin is washed away in baptism. However, we will still die and we still have this constant battle against the sin that resides in our flesh. So the guilt of original sin is forgiven, but the effects are not entirely removed until we die and are resurrected. He also adds that the Holy Spirit, given through baptism, begins to put to death the concupiscence and begins to create new movements within a person. Augustine speaks in the same way when he says, Sin is forgiven in baptism, not in such a way that it no longer exists, but so that it is not charged. Here he confesses openly that sin exists, It remains, although it is not counted against us any longer. Augustine's judgment on this point was so agreeable to those who came after him 
that it is often quoted in the decrees of the church councils. In Against Julian, Augustine says, The law, which is in the members, has been overturned by spiritual regeneration and remains in the mortal flesh. It has been overturned because the guilt has been forgiven in the sacrament by which believers are born again, but it remains because it produces desires against which believers struggle. Our adversaries know that Luther believes and teaches this, and since they cannot deny this, they instead try to pervert his words in an effort to crush an innocent man. They argue that concupiscence is a penalty, but not a sin. Luther maintains that it is a sin. It has been said above that Augustine defines original sin as concupiscence. If they don't like this, then let them argue with Augustine. Besides, Paul says in Romans 7, I would not have known what it is to covet, concupiscence, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Likewise, I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. No amount of sophistry can overthrow these points. They clearly call concupiscence sin, which is not charged against those who are in Christ, although by nature it is deserving of death where it is not forgiven. All controversies aside, this is what the fathers believe. Augustine, in a long discussion, refutes the opinion of those who think that concupiscence in a person is not a fault, but merely an incidental or inconsequential matter, just as the color of the body or ill health is said to be an adiaphora. All right, we're going to pause here. And so you noticed a couple things there that Melanchthon calls out the, the Romans for misquoting Luther and misrepresenting him. They're like, he's like, they know very well that Luther teaches no different than the scripture or the fathers. And because they can't deny the fathers, therefore they twist and pervert Luther's word. Uh, but we're not going to have any of that. So we're going to pause here for today. And we will pick up tomorrow in paragraph 42 of Apology Article 2. I'll see you then.